One of the key ideas of the English Restoration period is libertinism, which is a uh, where we get the word libertine. It is the flouting of moral codes, effectively. It is self-indulgence. It is a prioritization of sexual and also in intellectual freedom. Uh, it is sometimes uh, it is loosely associated with ideas like decadence, uh, a degree of aestheticism where art for art's sake comes in, and uh, to a degree a kind of hedonism, although that has a more explicitly sexual uh, connotation. This uh, emphasis on pleasure, physical pleasure especially, but as a, uh, as a kind of symbol of uh, an, an ideal physicality, an ideal uh, sense of joy, an experience of the ideal, if you will, and there we're getting into religion, uh, is, is a direct assault on the Puritan regime that preceded the Restoration era. Uh, Cromwell and, uh, and his cohorts uh, restricted the idea of pleasure and insisted that pleasure in this world is a trap, it is a sin, and we should be uh, focusing more on the afterlife, on a world of real pleasure after death with God. And so any pleasure in this world must be uh, illusory or, uh, or quite frankly sinful, a sign of future damnation. Uh, and but it is also <clears throat> in, in when you get into art and poetry, uh, it is a kind of uh, challenge to not pleasure but the pleasantness of figures like Dryden, of the figures who came along and tried to keep art relatively calm, tried to ease tensions, ease temperatures around England and get people to just get used to getting along again. After a very uh, tumultuous few decades, Dryden saw as a explicit purpose of his uh, work a unifying effect of not stirring people up too much and just uh, giving them, okay, let's all sort of stay calm. So there is a pleasantness about Dryden that the, uh, the libertines uh, directly assaulted. <laughs> <clears throat> And, uh, and, and of course, there is really no more uh, iconic member of the Libertine movement than uh, the second Earl of Rochester, John Wilma. And one of his most explicit, although it's not directly uh, uh, linked to him uh, explicitly as an author, one of his most explicit works is a short lyric called Regime de Vivre. Uh, and this is a this is a poem that many scholars debate whether or not it is his authorship. He never uh, there is no copy of it extant that was signed by him or said to be authored by him. It was just a poem that was found among his papers after his death, and some people will debate whether or not uh, he wrote it. It, the fact whether or not he did is honestly a point of very little interest to me. It is simply a, uh, I would say, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting example of restoration poetry within a uh, within that libertine movement, and what it is doing and how it is doing it. <clears throat> And it is also, quite frankly, uh, extraordinarily funny as a uh, good old-fashioned smut. Uh, misogynist, definitely. Uh, dirty, absolutely. But it is fun uh, with those things, uh, quite frankly, as much as you can be. Uh, so, well, you, you can judge. Regime de vivre. I rise at 11, I dine at 2, I get drunk before 7, and the next thing I do, I send for my whore, when, for fear of the clap, I come in her hand and I spew in her lap, then we quarrel and scold till I fall fast asleep, when the bitch growing bold to my pocket doth creep, she slyly then leaves me and to 
and to revenge my affront, at once she bereaves me of money and, and I ain't saying that word, if by chance then I wake, hot-headed and drunk, what a coil do I make for the loss of my punk? I storm and I roar and I fall in a rage, and missing my whore, I bugger my page. Then cropsick all morning, I rail at my men, and in bed I lie yawning till eleven again. <laughs> now, uh, regime de vivre, it means essentially a daily routine uh, for life. This is what you do every day of your life, and this is one hell of an itinerary. Uh, obviously, it is uh, it is very dirty. Obviously, it is very misogynist. There's no getting around that. Uh, but it, as a poem, it's really uh, kind of interesting. Now, on the surface, it has this kind of uh, doggerel feel. This uh, this iambic ten uh, tetrameter, four beats per line. I, honestly, it reminds me, as I am reading it, of The Night Before Christmas. It's a very bouncy, sort of happy, uh, up-tempo thing. Which, when you realize what is actually being said, this is not a little fairy tale for children. This is not something to read around the fire with your family. Uh, it, it, it is dirty, quite frankly. But it is uh, interesting in the way that it is formed and for what it is doing. Now, uh, it is iambic tetrameter. Tetrameter is the uh, the preferred or the customary mode of most Roman poetry. So it has a kind of uh, lineage here that is interesting. In content, it is very similar to the Roman poet Catullus. Uh, anybody who's familiar with Catullus can see the parallels immediately. Uh, so it has a bit of a tradition that it is playing within, and this poem is very clearly pointing forward to figures in the future uh, of English letters like Byron and uh, and uh, and Oscar Wilde. But that, uh, but if you look at it on the surface, also it is a fourteen-line poem. It is tetramic uh, versus uh, pentameter, so it is uh, so it is a little un unusual, but it is explicitly also a form of a sonnet, uh, and and it is not even just a single sonnet. It is uh, it it is in its way both forms of it. It is a Petrarchan sonnet. It has an I very clearly defined octet and sestet, the octet ending with the word I will not pronounce, the sestet then qualifying and taking a turn. In the division between the two is the, uh, the, the emission act, let's say. But it is also in its way a Shakespearean sonnet. And here it, you got to figure, okay, what is the nerve to take on a Shakespearean form? In England, just a hundred years or so, 150, after Shakespeare's death. So there's some haughtiness in this. This is formally a very bold and conventional poem. It is bold in its conventionality because of its uh, because of its content. Smutty stuff isn't supposed to sound like this, but it does. It has the nerve to do that. It challenges the status quo. You see how how that is developing there. But the, uh, the, the, the direct assault on Puritan values is, uh, is most notable in the content. And that sexuality that is expressed in here explicitly is a lot to get through. And it's not something you want to read in front of grandma. But it's also significant, I think, in what it is saying. This, uh, this regime de vivre is a uh, is a rather I think we can all agree a rather hollow existence a rather uh, almost dull existence. This is pure sensuality of a sort, but it is also nihilism, because this sensuality does not seem to bring a lot of joy. Uh, he wakes up at eleven. Yeah, he get, he he eats at two, and he gets drunk immediately uh, thereafter. Uh, Rochester is famous for saying he was once uh, uh, continually drunk for five years straight, or something like that. You know, uh, nobody is quali nobody is challenging his reputation as a drunkard. But again, this doesn't necessarily have to do with him. 
But that portrayal of just every day, you wake up, you sleep late, you wake up, you loll around, you, uh, you, you, you look for a sexual outlet, and if you cannot get it with your, uh, with your whore, which is not a particularly, uh, it is not complimentary, obviously, but it's also indicative of a not particularly emotionally fulfilling relationship. And if you can't get that, he is relatively fine, you have to assume, with uh, raping or sexually assaulting his young male attendant, his page, sort of a junior valet. Homosexuality is an interesting theme throughout the, the history of literature, but it has also, from the start, an analog of nihilism in that sexual congress between two men produces nothing. It is a dead end, uh, biologically. And the, uh, and, and that, that theme runs throughout this little subgenre of literature. Well, it's not a subgenre. It is a genre of itself. I'll give it that. But the, uh, but the sense of, uh, meaninglessness of nothing coming of any of this is rampant. Uh, this is a cycle, a regime of uh, behavior that is going nowhere. And then when you start to follow that logic, it is not necessarily a celebration of decadence, not necessarily a celebration of sexual freedom, but a uh, a cold-hearted objective look at it and what it means to be in a meaningless world is this a celebration of physicality or is this a condemnation of a uh, of a materiality that denies anything more that denies love the questions that evolve from this are, uh, are really fascinating. The questions that evolve from this start to suggest that it is more than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That libertinism is more than just the music and face of Keith Richards. The beliefs of libertinism are as much a social critique as they are an aesthetic pose.